The counting killer is on the loose. The TV blurred. He's very dangerous and has killed 12 people to date. Lock all windows and doors. We have a search team underway. I leapt to the windows. Rain pattered outside, down the glass in thick lines. I ran to the door, my footsteps shaking the little house. The chain slid against the metal. I turned back to the TV, my heart pounding. The police chief stepped down from the podium, a flurry of movement, microphones, cameras, pushing toward the stage like a tide coming in. Do you think he's going to kill someone tonight? A man asked. What kind of question is that? He groaned and death glared the reporter. Look... He's looking for a hideout. Might try to break into one of the houses near the penitentiary. Gasps. Murmurs. But don't worry. We'll catch him before that happens. A woman thrust a microphone into his face. I heard he likes to stalk the victims through the house before killing them. Is that true? I cannot confirm or deny that. The chief said, the wrinkle in his brow deepening. And he's covering up, I thought, turning the volume up. Of course he can confirm that. Teresa Rivers, victim number three, was stalked inside her house for hours. The forensics team even proved it. And he writes the number kill each victim is in their own blood, on their forehead, isn't that correct? A man yelled. Yes, that's correct. He said, his face starting to shine with sweat. And he- I flicked off the TV, my heart fluttering wildly in my chest. Lightning flashed outside, throwing the backyard into relief. The swaying trees and wooden fence were white against the black sky. Shadows danced across the trees, the grass, the patio. And if one had too much imagination, they appeared to take form. I tugged at the blinds, pulling them over the glass door. But some of them were missing. Thunder rumbled. The windows rattled. Anxiety bubbled up inside of me, ready to burst as I listened for sound over the fading thunder. Silence save for the pick, pack, pit of the swelling rain. And then the lights went out. Just my luck, I thought. The power's out. Never should have chosen a house so far from the main road. I stumbled toward the kitchen, banging into just about every piece of furniture along the way. I pulled at the drawers madly. There's got to be matches in here, I thought, as forks and knives clacked against each other. I stopped. What was that? The thud of footsteps. Barely. Over the rain. Or or was it just my imagination? Hands shaking, I grabbed the knife on the counter. No. A shadow. It disappeared behind the blinds, then reappeared in the gaps. Still frames of motion. Like the pages of a flipbook. I froze. The groan of metal resisting metal. The sound a locked door makes when someone tries to pry it open. Heart pounding. I ducked into the pantry. The air was thick and stale, steeped in expired bread and flour. I groped around for matches, a weapon, anything that might change my odds, but my hands only fell on cans of food. I locked the front door, the, the back, the windows. I leaned against the shelves, and they dug into my back. But even when everything's locked, there's always a way in. I gripped the knife harder. Footsteps squelching on the hardwood floor, moving through the living room. Looks in. A man's voice said, muffled through the door. Perfect. Maybe I can escape without him seeing, I thought. If he thinks the house is empty... My hands tightened around the doorknob. Footsteps sounded through the house, the dining room, and the family room. Pause. Louder. Toward the couch. The TV. The kitchen. I held a hand over my mouth. Silencing my ragged breath. No. Oh, no, no. Don't open this door. White light reflected off the floor, shining through the crack. And... But the door didn't open. The footsteps retreated now. Yes. Taking a deep breath, I turned the doorknob. I sprinted out of the pantry and through the dining room and the family room. I was almost free. I could feel the doorknob in my hands, the rain on my back. I yelped. Cold, wet fingers clawed into my shoulder. Don't move! He yelled, but I thrashed and wriggled, still gripping the knife. It slashed wildly at the man's arms. He crumbled to the floor, yelling in pain between me and the door. The man reached for his hip. A gun, gleaming in the dim light. I leapt up the stairs, shouts rang out behind me. My legs burned and grew stiff, but I kept going. A hole smoldered in the wall, a foot from my head. I ran and ran until I was in the master bedroom. Ow! 
I hissed. My toe collided with something long and soft, lying across the floor. Limping, I ran to the window, but nearly slipped as the floor was wet beneath me. I ran into the closet. I swallowed the urge to cough. The fake flowery smell of blouses and perfume was overpowering. Don't make a sound. Make a sound and you're dead. Do what I say and I won't have to hurt you. The voice called, hovering on the landing. Just come back down here and it'll all be over with. I gripped the knife harder. My shuddering breath seemed deafening in the tiny closet. More coming. You'll never win against us all. I peered through the crack. The man's shadow fell across the doorway, thin and stretched, almost subhuman. The silhouette paused, mumbled something into his shoulder, and continued towards the closet. The blood froze in my veins, shaking, and I stood up. I rose the knife above my head, and the doorknob turned. I rushed at him. In one smooth, powerful motion, the knife stabbed into his chest. I collapsed several feet away from the body. I did it, I thought. I'm alive. I threw my head back and began to laugh. I thought for sure I was dead meat. I laughed and laughed until my sides were sore. Then I stuck my finger in the blood and traced it across the man's forehead. Fifteen. Rumbling footsteps shook the house. Shouts, murmurs, stomps. White rays of flashlights swept across the house. He called for backup. I pushed the window open. With a deep breath, I slipped out of my victim's house and climbed down their flower trellis. I landed on the soft, wet ground below. Then, I took off running into the woods.